going to try to be as brief as possible tonight in the next two hours that I'll be speaking. I don't want to be like the fellow every time he got in the pulpit, he'd always preach from Genesis to Revelation. And one day he'd been in his lesson about two hours and a half. He said, now we've come to Isaiah, what are we going to do with him? One fellow stood up and said, you can have my seat, I'm going home. <laughs> so I won't, I won't keep you here that long. I understand that the head can only attain what the seat can endure. So I plan to, to get up and, uh, and speak up and shut up. But it's great, to, it's great to be here. It really is. I've been looking forward to it for a long time. And I appreciate all those beautiful smiles that I see on your faces. We as Christians are only approved on all the God's earth that really has a right to be happy. And uh, some of my brethren, boy, when I go, and, and uh, I like for everyone to be a preacher for one day or a song later, and just get up and stare at all their facial expressions on everyone that sits out there. I tell some brethren, if you're happy, you need to notify your face so they can rejoice with you. you know? <laughs> some faces that long look like you need other jobs to churn, but it's good to see all of them. It's good to see all the smiles, and, and I'm glad it's uh, it's uh, room temperature in here tonight because I'd hate for some of those facial expressions to freeze that way and you'd have to live the rest of your life. But it takes a lot less muscles to smile than it does frown. And a smile says the same thing in every language. It says, I like you. I enjoy being around you. I've been in a number of different countries and probably 30, 35 states, and that smile will get you in more doors than, than you can imagine. But it's great to be here and to be with Jimmy and Kathy and, and Frank and Karen. And we're looking forward to a great weekend together. As you probably notice, I always uh, use notes as I preach or teach because I really don't trust my memory uh, for anything. I'm kind of like the fellow that he carried a book with him and, and it, he always write down everything that happened to him in his life. And one guy, one day a guy came up to him and he said, uh, Sir, do you know a lady by the name of Mary Weatherspoon? And he gets out his little book, he says, just a moment, just a moment, ladies, ladies, ladies. And he starts reading on me. Mary Weatherspoon, yes, I know a lady with the name of Mary Weatherspoon. He says, sir, did you ever date a lady with the name of Mary Weatherspoon? Just a moment, sir, just a moment, ladies, ladies. Mary, yes, I date a lady with the name of Mary Weatherspoon. He said, uh, did you ever kiss a lady with the name of Mary Weatherspoon? Just a moment, sir, just a moment, kiss her. Yes, I kissed the lady in the name of Mary Weatherspoon. He said, I want you to know that I'm her husband, and I didn't like that. <laughs> he said, just want sir, likes and dislikes, likes and dislikes, <laughs> dislikes. I didn't like that either. <laughs> so that's why we're using those, all right? Let's open, let's open our Bibles now to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, that's our favorite chapter, and that's where we're going to launch from tonight is preach God's word in the next 35 minutes or so. Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. <clears throat> and when the day of Pentecost was now come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly they came from heaven a sound of the rushing of a mighty wind and filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them tongues parting asunder like as a fire, and it set upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Let's go now, if you would, please, to verse 22. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God unto you by mighty works and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, even if yourselves know, him being delivered up as a determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, even the hand of lawless men, did crucify and slay, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding on it. Notice verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God hath made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter, the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said unto them, Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and to the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For to you is the promise to your children, to all that are far off, even as the many of the Lord our God shall call unto him. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Then they that received his word were baptized, and there were added unto them in that day about 3,000 souls. 
They continued steadfastly in apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted to all, according as any man had need. And day by day continued steadfastly with one accord in the temple and breaking bread at home. They took their food with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added them day by day those that were being saved. Today, when the word Pentecost is mentioned in the religious world, Many of our religious friends, the first thing they begin to think of is tongue speaking or miracles. But I believe if I had been there that day on the day of Pentecost when this sermon was, was preached, I believe there would have been another word on my tongue, and that word would have been revival. I believe if there's anything that this congregation needs here in Rochester that we need in Conroe, Texas, is a revival. I think we need a revival that will pass through this congregation and will cause each one of us to become soul winners for Jesus. Somebody says, I know what, uh, what they had in the first century that we, that we don't have now. They had powerful pulpit preaching. They had that before Pentecost, and that didn't get the job done. Somebody says, I know what they had that we do not have. They had purity of doctrine. They had that before Pentecost, and it did not get the job done. What I believe they had, if I read Acts 2 correctly, was not even the miraculous endowment of the Spirit. But what they had is what Peter closed his sermon with in verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is Lord. You know, I'm going to be here all weekend, and I hope that's not the only amen I hear said. I believe if we had been there that day that we'd have heard that word ring out over and over and over again. Maybe it's the reason it's not coming out tonight because that's the truth that's not really in us that really doesn't move that soul. I'm telling you what, we've let the religious, our religious groups cause us to just sit on church pews and, and we're, we're emotionless, we're lifeless. I'm telling you, when I talk about the cross of Christ, that brings emotion to my life. I think many of us have Jesus as Savior tonight, but not as Lord. That word Lord means ruler or master. We go out to the religious world and say, aren't you people worried about dying? Aren't you worried about the second coming of Christ? Come on in the church and that's all we're worried again. You see? That's why we come across a lot of our people. We're not ourselves when we come to worship God. I want you to kind of picture yourself at a, at a football game, okay? I don't know if it's a, that big a sport in this area, but it's the final game of the season and, and the, the district is depending on that game and the score is tied 7-7. Seven, seven. There's 10 seconds left in the game. It's fourth down. Your team has the ball, and it's your son who's playing fullback. The quarterback takes a snap, and he hands off to the fullback, and your son, and you're standing up there in the, in the stadium with your wife eating popcorn and drinking a Coke, and your son starts down the, down the field with the football, and, and you're eating a popcorn. I said, well, honey, I believe that's our son. Did you see him break that tackle? Well, well look at that. He broke the second tackle. Well, he took the football all the way across the goal line. You wouldn't have it that way, right? You're going to throw popcorn and coke over it on everybody? You like what's happening down there on the field, right? I would have been my son. So we need to we need to realize when we come to worship God, to be ourselves. We go to a ball game to have fun. We go to a movie to cry. We come to church for free. So let's loosen up this, this weekend and enjoy ourselves, all right? Let the people know around us that we love one another, all right? But these good brothers, just 50 days before Pentecost, they did not have this conviction that I'm talking about here. They did not believe that Jesus was the Lord of all the universe. But in Romans chapter 10 and verse 18, the Bible says, Have they not all heard? The Bible says, Yea, their, their sound has gone forth in all the world. That group of disciples, numbering something like 132, took that message of Jesus into all the world in less than 30 years. From Pentecost day forward, when they preached Jesus is Lord, they set a record that's never been achieved. But it should be achieved over and over and over again. But I believe the reason that we have not achieved that same record that they did in the last 10 years, it's not because the same gospel is not ours, because it is. You see? 
But I believe when, when the phrase beats here in Rochester, New Hampshire, that beat there on the day of Pentecost, that Jesus is Lord, that we're going to begin to do the same thing that they did 2,000 years ago. I believe that with all of my heart. The same, the same gospel is ours, the same faith is ours, the same word is ours. The only thing that is lacking is for the same Lord to be ours. And brethren, when that happens, when Jesus becomes the Lord of this congregation, you better fasten your seatbelts because things are getting ready to happen. I believe that anything that God controls grows. I believe that. But, but before we get to uh, Pentecost, let's look at this group of people just 50 days before Pentecost, these disciples, these apostles, and see what they were really like. First of all, their fellowship was marred by certain ones who were wanting to be great in the kingdom. He said, I want to be number one. No, you were number one last week. It's my turn now. I want to be number one. Brother, we need to realize there's no rank among slaves. The ground is all level before the cross. There's no big eyes and little use in the kingdom of God. All we are as Christians is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Right? So there were some of them who were jockeying for position. But I'm glad there's nothing like that in the Lord's church today, that we all have it all worked out. But not only was this fellowship marred by men who were jockeying for position, but their leaders were sound asleep in the time of Christ. I mean, these three that Jesus took with him and he seemingly spent more time with them than any of the others, he said, will you watch here while I go yonder and pray? You know when Jesus came back from praying in the garden, what he found? Those three sound asleep. How in the world could they sleep yonder here when, when my Lord was yonder praying and pouring out his heart to his Father that would be his will that that cup would pass from him? Probably for the same reason that we're sound asleep today in our comfortable church pews while the world is dying and going to the devil's hell. I'd like for you to, if you don't get anything else out of anything I say this weekend, I hope this thought stays with you all the days of your life. How would you like to be an unbeliever and live in this city and depend on this congregation for your salvation? How would you like to be an unbeliever at Dover, wherever you're from tonight? Let the shoe be on the other foot and depend on that congregation where you worship for your salvation. The church, brothers, is the lighthouse. We've got to shine. But in the third place, there was a very close friend, a treasure, that had sold his Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. I think at times we believe that if we had been back there in the first century and walked in the footsteps of Jesus, that our faith would have been so much stronger. I really don't believe that. I believe with what I have for me today, the written word, I can read the miracles that Jesus did. I believe we have something today that the angels and the prophets desire to look into. We shouldn't live as if the cross was something that happened 2,000 years ago. But we should live as if Christ died yesterday, arose this morning, and is coming tomorrow. That we can get out of our bed in the morning and go and push the curtains back and say, Lord, is this the day that you're coming back? The cross needs to be that real to us. And when it is, things are going to, going to begin to happen in our lives. But the point I want to make is that Judas was with his Lord for three years. You know what? That man's heart was still unchanged. Can you imagine that? The man still had gold dust in his eyes after walking with my Lord for three years. But how many of us tonight, if we're honest with ourselves, have been wearing the name Christian, we've been walking with him for 12 years, for 5 years, for 14 years, but our hearts are still unchanged. Our hearts are still unchanged. Peter, the outstanding spokesman, had denied Jesus just 50 days before Pentecost. And the third time he denied him with an oath. You know what? I believe tonight, out of all the sins that are listed in the Bible, in, in Galatians 5, in Romans 1, in Colossians 3, in Revelation 21, I believe the greatest sin of all is love despised. When you as parents do everything uh, within your power to rear your children, to feed them, to clothe them, to educate them, and one day that son or daughter were to grow up and denounce you as his parents, I don't know of anything on all of God's earth that would hurt me anymore than for Jeff or Mark, our two sons, to do that. So I'm saying the greatest sin of all is love despised. When God has done all he can do to save sinful mankind, he was to the extent of sending his son to die, and we continue to live the kind of life that we want to live, I don't know of anything to curse God anymore. I believe we're walking across the heart of God with hobnail shoes on. 
when, when Sunday morning comes and Jesus said, come and commune with me. Come eat at my table. And we say, not today, Lord, I'm going fishing. Not today, Lord, I'm going on a picnic. So we're saying by our actions that the, the Lord's table has second place in our life. I picture Jesus as he looks down upon us at times and he says, Father, is that what I really died for? Don't they love me enough to take that message of the cross to everyone that they see? <coughs> so I'm saying I believe the greatest hindrance to the church of my Lord in the 20th century is not modernism, it's not liberalism, but it's inconsistent living. We come here and we sing, oh, how I love Jesus, the veins bulge in our neck as we sing. But does it really show as we go outside of these walls? Do we really love him enough to take that message? Fifty days before Pentecost, I would have not prophesied much for this cowardly group of disciples. But now Pentecost is coming, they're all together. Judas is dead. The man he had to be dead to repent, didn't he? Because one man with the name of Jonah almost caused a ship to wreck. One man with the name of Achan caused Israel to suffer defeat. So Judas is dead, Peter has repented, and the church is now pure again. But I want you to try to picture Peter there. At one time he said, Lord, I'll never deny you. You can count on me. I'm going to be there swinging my sword. I believe Peter meant that. You know why? Because he was there swinging his sword. But you know, Peter let, let a little old lady, woman, back him up in a corner and cause him to deny my Lord. He said, I don't know the man. I don't know the man. I swear in the sight of God, I don't know the man. And then Peter looks into the face of the one that he just denied. I want you to try to picture the, the facial expression that must have been on Jesus as he looked at Peter. The one that he said he would never deny. And I want you to try to picture the facial expression that must be on our Lord many times when we disappoint him, when we fail to live the kind of life that he wants us to, that he wants us to live. But the Bible says that Peter went out and went bitterly. I wonder if Peter prayed. I wonder if he prayed. Of course he prayed. I bet he said, Lord, I know it's impossible, but give me one more chance. But Peter still watched from a distance as Jesus walked the lonely road to Calvary. Peter watched from a distance as my Lord was nailed to that cross. Peter watched from a distance as he was taken down. Peter watched from a distance as he was laid in that empty tomb. I'm sure he said, Lord, I know it's impossible, but give me one more chance. And then a short time later, Peter was out in the boat fishing, and he looked on the seashore and saw Jesus walking by. The Bible says he jumped overboard. He swam to shore for that one more chance, for that forgiveness, and denying his Lord. Maybe that explains the power of Pentecost that we're talking about tonight. In the next place, the text says in Acts 2, 42 through 46, they were all together in one place. You see, there is unity, there's togetherness. That's the pattern of spiritual power. When we're together, things are going to happen. You see, because God has ordered it. God said in Genesis chapter 11, if I say something tonight that you don't agree with, I want you to come to me after service and let's talk about it, all right? But in Genesis chapter 11, there was a group of people gathered together there to do an ungodly deed. They were going to build a power that was going to reach to heaven. And the Bible says in Genesis 11 that they could do anything that they imagined to do. You know why? Because they were one mind. One mind. But what did God do? He came down and confused their language where they could not understand one another and brought that thing to a stop. Now listen to me, brothers and sisters. If a group of ungodly people are gathered together to do an ungodly deed, and because they are one mind, they can do anything that they imagine to do, then surely we deny who are God's children, with God's help, can do anything, underlined it eight or ten times, we can do anything that we so choose to do with God's help. Do we believe that? Amen. But how many times do we bow down to the almighty dollar? There's times in Conroe that I feel like getting the budget and just holding up. Almighty budget, will you let us have a campaign? Oh, great budget, can we do this? The budget in Conroe is not God-inspired. That thing changes about every month down there. And if we don't have the money there, we just pass and have a special contribution to go ahead and take care of the thing and get on with God's work. 
Anytime we let dollars determine what's going to be done at the work of the church, that is the death day of that congregation. That is the death day of that congregation. So if we be of one heart and one mind, there is nothing impossible for us to do. Ephesians 3.20 is still in our check again the other, the other day. It says, Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Boy, I can think big. I can ask a lot. But you know the God I serve tonight is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that. You, know, you see our problem, brother, we ask God for peanuts when our God is a billionaire. We say, God, can you give us a congregation of 200 members? He said, can I do what? Earl, do you understand I spoke that thing into existence that you're walking around on down there on earth? I spoke that thing into existence. And you asking me if I can give you this? How about asking me for this city? How about asking me for the state? How about asking me for the New England area? And let me give that into your hand. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, be it unto you according to your faith. Our faith is too small. We need to lift up our eyes. I think many times we're like a baby elephant. You can take a little baby elephant and, and uh, tie it to an iron stake and a chain around its leg, and that elephant will, will walk out until it feels that tug on its leg. It'll take one more step like that. It's tied. It cannot go any further, right? But after about six months, you can take the iron stake up and the chain and just put a little wooden stake in the ground and just a real small cord around it and around the elephant's leg. You know what that elephant's going to do? It's going to walk out to build that little tug on its leg. You know what it's going to do? Take one more step. Is it tied down here? Where's it tied? In its mind. It's tied in its mind. You see, if we as a brotherhood, we're still tied in our mind. We, have, we look at this congregation. They're not doing any great things, so why should we? What is our example to look at? I'm telling, I was telling Jimmy today coming in, I believe it's Peter and <clears throat> Paul and James and John and all those, our brothers up there that's part of that great cloud of witnesses tonight, as they are looking down here on earth and thinking about the, <clears throat> the time in the 20th century, I, I bet they're saying our brotherhood today on earth, I bet they'd make, Pente, uh, they'd make Pente, Pentecost look like a devotional where we just had 3,000 baptisms. I bet they're having 5,000 baptisms or 10,000 baptisms in one day. You ever thought about that? Where's our faith? What do they have that we don't have? You know, in 2 Kings chapter 6, I love that chapter. I love uh, a lot of chapters, <laughs> a lot of books, <clears throat> every one of them, all 66 of them. But in that chapter, Elijah's servant woke up one morning, and he looked out and he saw the city surrounded by the enemy. And he was afraid. He said, Master, we're going to perish. It's all over. You know what Elijah prayed to for us? prayed for that day, that God would open the eyes of his servant. That's the only miracle that took place that day. That's all. And you know when that when his eyes were open, what did he see? He looked out there and saw the hills filled with the chariots of Jehovah God. You see? God didn't send those things when Elijah prayed. They were already there. So when Elijah's servant's eyes were open, he saw what was there. So, brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to tell you tonight, help is not on the way. Help is already here if we'll just open our eyes and look out here and see the hill surrounded with the church of God and just ask God to give us the help and the strength and the power that we need to do these things. You know, in, in 2 Kings chapter 7, <clears throat> we're talking about the four lepers there. Man, I mean, things were, things were in a bad way. They began to think that thing through, and they said, if we stay here, we're going to die. And if we go to Syrian camp, we may die, but what's the big deal? At least we're going to be going where there's food, if they were to let us in or whatever. But you know what? As they started toward that Syrian camp, you know what God did? He took those eight little feet that were walking along there, those four lepers, eight feet, and God magnified those little eight steps to such a degree that it sounded like hosts of chariots and riders coming in. You know what the Syrian army did? Man, they flat got out of there. They left that place. They thought, who in the world is coming? Uh, the Hittites and all these people coming after us. And when those four lepers got there, what did they find? <laughs> that camp was completely deserted. Man, they had the food. They had all the, the gold, the silver. 
you know. Now, if God can do that with four lepers, four lepers' feet, magnify that to such a degree. Can God not work in the hearts and lives of people in Rochester to open them that we can go out and share that message of Jesus? I believe He can. I believe that's the God I serve tonight. The God I serve is the one that spoke this universe into existence. The God I serve is the one that parted the water and let Moses and God's children cross on dry ground. I want you to picture Moses there with the rod or his, in his hand, or his, and he looks over his shoulder and sees the dust of Pharaoh and his army coming. Nowhere to go. More than two of them. Why don't we tell our children about Joshua and Caleb and not about these other fellows? Huh? Why is it? Because Joshua and Caleb were what kind of men? They were men of faith, right? No problem, we can handle it. The others came back and said, oh no, we're like, we're like grasshoppers, we can't do it. I think some of those ten <laughs> said it's the business meetings that I've been in. We, we, <laughs> we've never done it that way before. It won't work. Where's the money going to come from? I'll tell you what. Uh, I've left business meetings, and I've made the statement. I said, brethren, I'm sure God would like to have a part in what we're getting ready to do, uh, to do tonight, but we didn't give him any room to work. Anytime you can see from the beginning to the end of the thing, there is absolutely no faith involved. Zero. Zero faith. And the Bible says in Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it is impossible to please God. Now we need to quit walking by sight and start walking by faith and watch as God begins to work in our lives to accomplish great things. We've set some goals in, in uh, Conroe, Texas, and one of them is to, I'm not going to name the, <coughs> the two religious groups, but one of them, we're going to use their building as a benevolent room, and the other we're going to use it to make a bus barn out of it, to house the buses. We don't have to go out and build a building, just convert the people that worship in those places and use their building, right? That's so much cheaper. <laughs> and, and you know, we need, to, we need to realize how powerful the Word of God really is. You know, I'm going to get up some Sunday morning, and, and I'm not too far away from doing that. I, I won't do it here this Sunday. But I'm going to get up and end my lesson. I'm going to take a, a stick of dynamite, just a faith fuse, and light that thing and, and pitch it out in the audience. And, and once all the seats empty and everyone leaves, and the thing finally fuses and burns out there, and they all come back and they're seated again. And I say, why did you people leave? Where are you crazy thing? We thought you were going to blow up the whole building. You see, they expected something to happen, right? Anytime you see a stick of dynamite burning, what do you expect? Something's going to happen. You're going to move out of that place, right? <clears throat> but you know what? Paul said in Romans 1.16, the gospel is what? The power of God and the salvation. This right here is dynamite. This right here will change lives. But how many of us as preachers stand in pulpits and preach sermons from God's Word? Bible class teachers stand in classes and teach God's Word? But we really don't expect lives to be changed. Do you really believe that I would leave my wife and two sons and come 2,000 miles to preach the Word of God if I didn't expect lives to be changed this weekend? There's no way. I'd stay there with them. I love my family. But I believe through the preaching of God's Word this week that lives are going to be changed. I've even thought about uh, putting my waiters on and preaching a sermon from the baptistry. You know, expecting things to happen, expecting souls to be led to Christ. I'm telling you, it's time that we start to be optimistic. Right? Right. All right? <clears throat> In the last place, I'm going to put some babies on tape tomorrow night. <laughs> In the last place tonight, I want you to notice that they had a great prayer meeting. They prayed, y'all listen to this, they prayed for 10 days preached a few hours and had 3,000 responses. Now, if you don't think we have that thing worked out of shape, listen to this. We go out and preach for 10 days, pray for a few minutes, and wonder why we can't have 10 baptisms in one week. We have to have help rather than get it so messed up. We could have done it on our own. I think it's a shame. I think it's a shame. Could their secret have been here the people who marched on their knees, trusting not in their doctrine, trusting not in their ability, trusting not in their power and their number and their programs, but they were trusting in their Lord. That's where the strength came from. That's why they accomplished what they did. 
in the first century. Now, y'all listen to me. Do you really want a revival here? Is my voice carrying all the way back to the <laughs> You know what the word revival means? We've been afraid to use that word for a long, long time. That word means getting right with God. Now, when this congregation gets right with God, brother, things are going to happen in this area. Take my word for it, all right? Things are going to happen. Now, do you really want a revival? Yeah. Man, it costs a lot to have a revival. It costs you. It costs me. It costs a lot to have a revival. Because the text says they counted not anything as they had as if it were theirs. The Bible says they believed. They were together. They had all things common. And they sold. We usually emphasize the last. And they sold. But the Bible says they were together. They had all things common. And then they sold. If you want a Pentecost revival, it's going to have to be preceded by Pentecost preparation. And we're going to have to come as servants with clean hands, offering the fruit of the Spirit. But above all else, we're going to have to come with a sacrifice. Now listen to me. The blessings will not come from God until the sacrifice is on the altar. Did you hear what I said? The blessings will not come from God until the sacrifice is on the altar. The blessings did not come up on Abraham until when? Until the sacrifice was on the altar. And brothers, we expect God's blessing to fall upon unsacrificial hearts and upon unsacrificial congregations. It will not happen. Now, if you sacrifice tonight, I'm not talking to you. <coughs> so you can't get upset with me. <coughs> <clears throat> if you're sacrificing tonight you cannot get you know I'm not talking to you you can't get upset with me alright but I'm talking to me and I'm talking to 99% of my brethren it's hard for me to believe that we really sacrifice when we give 3 or 4 hours a week at the most to our Lord we don't sacrifice our money if we did we'd be so far above the budget here that you men would have to meet every night trying to find a missionary to send somewhere if we were really sacrificing for Jehovah God. I'm a little disappointed in me, and I'm a little disappointed in you. But I believe that the truth hurts. It's just going to have to hurt a little bit because I know it's going to get better. It's going to hurt. When I sing that song in just a moment that we'll be singing, <clears throat> all to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. That causes a big lump to come in my throat. I will ever love and serve you. And in his presence, they will live. Are we really sacrificing for the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we really have a right to call him Lord? Is he really the ruler and the master of our lives? I believe if he was, that this building would be filled and folding chairs would be out in the aisle to accommodate the people that would be here tonight. <clears throat> Before I close, I want to get a little bit personal. <clears throat> I've just known you for a matter of minutes. But I want to ask the young people that are assembled here tonight, I want to ask you, first of all, are you willing to make Jesus the Lord of your life? Are you willing to stand up for him in the hallways of the high school or the junior high where you attend? Are you willing to stop that classmate and ask if you can come over and study with them from God's Word? Are you willing to be laughed at and put down and made fun of because of the stand that you've taken for Jesus? We have some 30 or 40 of our teenagers in Conroe that carry their Bibles. Our teenagers, teenage boys carry their New Testament in their, in their hip pocket, and the teenage girls carry theirs in their purse. They'll stop people in the hallway. They'll set up studies with their teacher. They're not ashamed to stand up and confess Jesus is Lord. You Bible school teachers, I know you do a good job, but are you willing to do a better job? Are you willing to stay up an hour later on Saturday night to make Jesus the Lord of that lesson? You personal evangelists who are trained to be soul winners, are you willing to give up an hour of TV a night to go out and share it with someone the message of the cross? One thing is needful for young people to make Jesus your Lord. 
One thing is needful for parents is to make Jesus your Lord. One thing is needful for personal evangelists is to teach Jesus your Lord. Everyone here in this audience tonight is going to respond. Everyone may not come forward, but everyone's going to respond. You're either going to go upward or downward in your service to God. You cannot stay where you are. So I'm asking you tonight, are you willing to make Jesus the Lord of your life? Are you tired of just playing church? You're really to, ready to wade out into the deep and get wet all over it. And just put your total weight down on him. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. And that's where the victorious life really begins. You're walking along here, and you, this is a big rock cliff. And you, <clears throat> and you fall over the side, and you, you catch on a big piece of shrubbery down here. And you begin to hang on. And you cry out, Lord, save me. Your idea of safety is back up here where you put your feet on something solid. But the Lord says, Earl, I'm going to save you. Turn loose. You say, I don't see anything but sudden death. He says, turn loose. You feel the butterflies come. Turn loose, Earl. And you, you, I turn loose, and there he is. I'm right in the palm of his hand. Today, I got on a plane in Houston, Texas. I didn't see a pilot in that cockpit. I knew they were there. I hope they've been trained. But I said, Pilot, take me to Boston, Massachusetts. I go to the doctor and he says, Earl, you have a, an illness that needs, it needs corrective surgery. Doc, where's the operating table? Put me on it and start cutting. Doc, here's my life. Jesus is saying, Earl, if you do that with a pilot that you've never seen, you do that with a doctor that you don't even know, what's your problem about just giving me your life? Step out here. Let me have it. And let me take it and mold it and make it something beautiful out of it. Really make you into a soul winner for Jesus. The future of this congregation is in your hands. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? Are you willing for Jesus not only to be your Savior, but the Lord of your life? You mothers and fathers, are you willing to start that example, set that example for your son, for your daughter? I'm going to close with this illustration. I have a friend, Bob Brown, and he was in Trinidad for a number of years. One day he was there sitting out on the street in his van, and a little old lady, <coughs> a little old lady happened by, and she introduced herself to Bob, and, and she said, Mr. Brown, I'd like for you to come to my home, and I want to show you some dancing dolls that I have. Bob said, ma'am, I'm, I'm sure you do, but I'm real busy, and I'm waiting on my friend, but she was very persistent. And Bob promised her that he would come with his friend as soon as he returned to the van. And so within 10 minutes or so, they were there at her house where the address she had given. They didn't see any dogs, and they began to wonder if this lady was really putting them on. <clears throat> but just in a moment or two, she came down the stairs with about three dogs following her. And these dogs were so poor that you could see every bone in their body. There was no hair on their back. They were dying from malnutrition. And this lady came down, and she had a little piece of bread in her hand. And she began to hold that bread up over the uh, head of those dogs. And she said, dance, dogs, dance, dance, dogs, dance. And the dogs began to leap to get one bite of that bread to just live one more day. You know what Jesus said? That he's the bread of life. Right here it is, the bread of life. You know what we've been doing for nearly 2,000 years? We've been holding that bread up over the heads of the world, and we say, dance, world, dance, dance, world, dance. We've been saying, dance, neighbor, dance, dance, neighbor, dance. I have the bread of life, but you can't have it. Brothers and sisters, I wonder if we continue to be selfish with this message, is there really a place waiting for us? Call it heaven. How can we be selfish with the message of the cross? We're going to sing, all to Jesus I surrender. Are you willing to give him your all tonight to rededicate your life to be a soul winner for Jesus as we stand and sing? <coughs>